What is going on, everybody? I think my intro might have been cut off there. What's going on, everybody? It's Triple Crown 24 back today. My stream yard was uh, acting up. It said that it wasn't live. Anyways, <laughs> that blunder aside, uh, part two electric boogaloo of my Molar card show recap. This was for Saturday, April 30th, the final day of April here. Uh, definitely finally felt like April. Most of April has been very cold here, and I think that contributed to the attendance at today's show because this was probably the slowest I have ever seen this show, and I've been going to this one for several years now, and it's it's the most well-known show in the area, I would say. Uh, so just very interesting overall. That kind of leads into the overall impressions. I, I heard this so much on Friday that people said that it was good for a Friday, and typically Friday is kind of like your bonus day. Uh, for me personally, I've always thought Friday was better than Sunday in terms of uh, volume of sales. Uh, Sunday is more so like dealers trying to make deals with other dealers on the way out the door. That's usually what I feel. And Friday is kind of like that too, but it's uh, it's first pickings and you know there's everything is still there. There's nothing that's been taken out of uh out of play yet so it was very interesting today to hear that a lot of dealers some very prominent dealers some dealers that i've known for quite some time who said that it wasn't the best show for them uh which you know is always disappointing to hear and want to see the dealers doing well you want to see the people doing well uh, a lot of looking but not buying was the general vibe that i got at the show today for me personally it was more so quality over quantity and not just even in terms of the cards i will uh we'll get to that in the final segment here but i'm sure everyone wants to see the pickups so why don't we go ahead and get into it i'll start with the uh more exciting ones so the very first thing that i did today was go to a booth to go try to get a card for my friend mike over at baseball collector and i'm sure you'll see these in his mail day recap video when he gets these in from me uh but we kind of had a talk earlier in the morning about the game plan and kind of what he was looking for and i gave him kind of an overview of the show because this is largely a vintage show and that's right up his alley uh so i was telling him about a few of the things that i saw and there was this card in particular i don't want to spend too much time on it because it is his card so i don't want to take away the thunder from him on it but it is a 1965 Topps Ernie Banks, and this is a significant one for him. I, again, am not going to say too much more about it. You can check out his video when he gets it in, and he'll tell you more about, uh, you know, what it means to him. And I don't want to steal, like I said, I don't want to steal the thunder from him. I also bundled in this uh, Frank Robinson. Very strange to see him here with the Los Angeles Dodgers. 72 Tops traded. See there, part of the... Uh, Really high number there at 754. So he's able to bundle those two cards together in a partial cash, partial trade deal. This is a dealer I typically don't approach with trades. He's been doing it for a very long time. He's a nice guy, but I, a lot of the stuff that I bring to trade typically wouldn't be necessarily up his alley, mostly because, well, it's a lot of newer stuff. He doesn't sell too much newer stuff. Uh, but I did have my 70 tops of Willie Mays on hand. And I was able to work that into a deal. So essentially what I was able to do was to uh, exchange the card for another for another card and then sell it to Mike uh, to help him out and to help myself out, right? Uh, I was able to give him a good deal because I didn't have that much into the maze at this point in time. And then I was also able to um, you know, knock two cards off his list as well. So that is something that I will look to do with trades is that Sometimes it's not necessarily trying to go uh, up in value or to, you know, totally win the trade. Sometimes it's just to be able to become a little bit more liquid from a dealer's perspective. So I thought I'd share that story. That's the only reason I showed off those cards. Typically, I let whoever uh, I buy the cards for show them off and that way they get to talk about them and they get to reveal them, if you will. Uh, but instead... Uh, I, I thought this was relevant to kind of the experience today. I did pick up 
some cards for myself. A lot of raw stuff here over in the corner that I'll show you. I picked up two Soto slabs. Shout out to my friend Ed Wesker Griff. These might actually end up in his possession at some point. I always ask Ed about my Sotos. We kind of uh, exchange a lot of texts about Soto cards. He's he's my go-to guy uh, for Soto stuff. There's several of you out there who like him. Shout out to Eric from those back pages. Shout out to Shane, Shoebox Legends. There's a lot of Soto guys out there. Uh, but this 2019 Finest Refractor, this is his first Finest card. PSA 8 doesn't really matter too much on the grade for me. I thought it was reasonable enough to go ahead and jump on it. And then this Montgomery Club set uh, from 2018. This is a PSA 9. These particular ones are tough because a lot of them were just printed off center. Uh, usually on promos like this, uh, I would try to stay away from 9s because I, I feel that promos are typically – very well maintained and overall you'll typically see a lot of promo cards especially from recent years uh maintain their condition where they don't come out as janky if you will uh and by promo cards i just mean like you know these are you have to pay to get the montgomery club set right the montgomery club is not cheap but this is a a promotional set set that is sent to you to my knowledge so um, that's what I mean by that, but cards that are similar in the way that you would acquire them. Uh, I have one more slab, but that one will wait until the end. I went digging in some value boxes. There were several showcase cards that I was looking at, and it was just wasn't able to make a deal on quite a few of them. Uh, I've w probably walked past each table a few dozen times at this point, uh, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to just – just walk away. Sometimes it's okay to walk away. So uh, first up, I did pick up, I think this is like 27 cards here from a dollar box. I was able to knock it down to 20. This will be some store fodder slash whatnot fodder. Uh, that's kind of something that I'm planning to uh, pick up a little bit more is my whatnot presence and getting, uh, getting some more lives on there. So if you go search Triple Crown 24, uh, may actually have a show going on at the time that you're watching this video. So, hey, you never know. But uh, a lot of times I will show these these types of cards in my videos, and that's typically where you're going to see them available for sale if they're not in my eBay store. So um, that little shameless plug aside, let me show you some of the cards I picked out. Just some cool stuff, some random stuff. Uh, Teddy Bruschi, excuse me, uh, Ultimate Collection, base there to 525, Champ Bailey, Relic card, Debo, not that Debo, the original Debo, Join Bow, uh, White Refractor. These are numbered at 869. Interesting uh, numbering there. There were several Dante Culpepper relics in there. So, I mean, less than a buck for a Culpepper relic. Why not? Uh, these pink prisms are exclusive to one of the retail formats. I forget which one, but it, it's a decent enough player then usually i'll take a flyer on these matty ice i would say is a very solid player so bradley chubb good shout out to eric uh a little numbered peyton some more call peppers there's actually a lot of call peppers in here uh just some lower end autographs as well i have several different things that i do with these so uh whenever i see more recent by more recent i mean like 2010 or newer autograph that's licensed, it will typically go ahead and pick it up if it's a dollar without thinking about who it is. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, same thing goes with Relic cards, as you will see with one of the ones that's coming up. Uh, Zach Ertz, a little Crusade right there. Rookie, and I thought that was pretty cool. Big Play Slay, Orange Refractor. And another one of those, Jake Matthews. Earl Thomas Camo, I thought that was pretty sweet. This is the one that I was talking about. We're just going to breeze right past it. Uh, just know that I have a I have a purpose for it. <laughs> uh, Tyler Egby, Super Bowl champ. Nice little Ray Lewis to 99 there. Looks like it's creased. No, that's just the penny sleeve. That would have been disappointing. Another Culpepper. Uh, Todd Gurley, rookie ticket relic. Man, this guy, what a fall from grace. He, he was the hottest thing in the hobby there. Back in 2018 and 2019 during that first Rams Super Bowl run. Uh, Larry Fitz, rookie. 
Why not? Another Culpepper there. Uh, number Drew Brees. Figure, go ahead and grab that. Well, Keyshawn Johnson dual relic to 99 and a D hop to 49 there, red. So, uh, overall, just solid value box pickups there. And then I went into a couple of different boxes. So, all of these cards at the very most ended up costing $2.50 at the most on some of these. And a lot of them were less uh, based on how the, the stack kind of played out. So again, this is mostly what not fodder. Some of these I might take a little closer look at for well, numerous reasons. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff that, that they may be going towards, but just some newer autographs here. Um, this guy just was part of a no hitter, got pulled after five innings, but Tyler McGill, the Mets, some Lindor stuff here, Andrew Vaughn, Optic, Orange. And some lower end autos, Rutschman, Raywave. Forgot this was part of, this was supposed to be part of the previous one. Nice little Drew Blood, uh, blood so there. This guy right here, I get asked about him all the time on whatnot, Santiago Espinal. I've never really seen him do anything crazy. I don't know if there's something that I'm missing, but I hear it a lot and I, I tend to think that I follow baseball pretty closely. And I know that this guy, like, he's a, he's a solid player. I've seen him play, but I've never seen him do anything that's, like, amazing. But I've had several people ask about this guy. So any Blue Jays fans out there or anyone who is more knowledgeable about, about Santiago Espinal, I would like to be in the loop on that. David Price Orange, that's out of 25, 14 to 25, which was his jersey number, I believe, at one point in time, or I think it was with the Tigers. Uh, this call pepper was also in there from earlier. A little two, a number to 79. Uh, this was just out of 10. I do, I'm not too familiar with Dalton Keene, but it was out of 10, so I went ahead and grabbed it. Uh, Shane McClanahan, X Fractor, number 299, rookie debut. Then some Tops Chrome Black. If you look at these boxes, I think it's like $150 now for these on the secondary market for 2021. And you only get two base cards per box. There is 100 base cards. So with perfect collation, it would take you 50 boxes to get the player that you want. So if I see the base for cheap enough, and $2 is definitely cheap enough for me, I will grab it of certain guys. So Soto and Tatis fit that mold. Also Bobby Dahlbeck. I know he's not you know lighting the world on fire by any means. But... Uh, <laughs> He's uh, you know, it's it's it was two dollars or two dollars and fifty cents, one of the two. So I figure why not? And then Ryan Jeffers as well, who just uh, I forget who he hit it off of, but he took one of the Tigers uh, pitchers deep the other day. I think it was him. I know Kepler got the better of us the other day. Uh, Taylor Trammell, blue refractor rookie. Why not? A couple of these Jordan Lawler refractors from twenty twenty one Bowman's best. I get asked about this guy too a lot. He hit like a 500 foot home run the other night uh, in Triple A. Sam Huff over Lawler, uh, Lava Flow, whatever those are called. More of those. A little B -B -B Benny Montgomery, Cal Mitchell, Randy, the James Bond one of one double is seven out of one fifty. Manoa Refractor, shout out to Kim. Bean ball, uh, beans at a ball card blog. Easy for me to say. Little Jordan Kaepernick in this uh, very robust penny sleeve here. Gold Reactor. Uh, this Jordan is a metallic, which I thought was pretty cool. Fiedo, he actually had a pretty good start for AAA uh, Toledo, and then a indie Kyle Hendricks. So, I, I mean, just really random stuff. But uh, my thought with that has always been to kind of make it available in my store and to open up uh, opportunities for people to add those into their collections who maybe don't get the chance to go to shows or would have never got the chance at those cards any uh, otherwise. So uh, this is the final pickup. If you remember my Larry Bird autograph from the other day, and by the other day, I mean yesterday, <laughs> I uh, have already departed with it in a partial cash, partial trade. It was a very hot card. I brought it back with me today. 
and it was probably the most asked about card in my box. My 500 home run club relic also was very much asked about, but I traded it away and I got this card and I've, I've always loved this particular card. This is, I guess, a card of that card, but it is signed. Hammerin Hankerin, PSA DNA certified. This is the 1989 Tops Turn Back the Clock card 663 in the set. And it commemorates the 1974 Tops card number one, Hank Aaron. The new all time home run king. I'm sure most watching this will be familiar with the story, but Hammer and Hank. Uh, was not the home run king yet at the time that that card was produced. It was card number one, so it was released right away at the start of baseball season. And uh, Hank had not passed Babe Ruth yet for the home run record, so it was kind of a, a premature thing that was uh, that was printed there. But I, I just love the confidence and the balls that Tops had to make that. You can see it is signed up here, and it is numbered down there out of 1974 so this was a buyback i i forget what this was a buyback from uh my research is is failing me here but i saw this on day one and i just kind of kept it in the back of my mind and the opportunity struck and having that bird autograph was able to uh save me a couple hundred dollars cash in order to acquire this beauty that will be in my possession unless the right number <laughs> comes across the table for me. So let's move into, uh, I'm going to skip the show floor review because I really already talked about that yesterday. This video, ironically enough, is probably going to go longer, even though I had fewer cards to show off. Uh, what was hot and what was not today? It was very different today than it was on Friday, which I thought was interesting but also it makes sense uh typically on you know it's a friday night that this was happening and there's not too many shows that i know that go on in the evening time and you get a different crowd i, I feel on a friday night it's people who are coming in after work or as i think saturday and sunday bring in more of a casual crowd or you're going to have at least more opportunities for casual buyers to jump in uh and go after some of the stuff that's on the floor. Uh, but overall, a lot of the dealers are telling me that it was extremely slow from what they typically do at this show. A lot of these guys have been setting up here for years and years and years. Uh, some of them, some dealers were having good days, but some dealers were saying that this is one of the worst shows that they've done recently, which I thought was very surprising because this show, it's not cheap to set up at and it has a very good reputation. So uh, I was disappointed to hear that for the dealers. It, from what it looked like, just observing people, the value boxes, the very few of them that were out there, there was a lot of people huddled around those. And a lot of people looking around at the showcase cards, if you will, the big fancy slabbed cards, but not too many people pulling the trigger on them. That's been kind of my impression whenever I've set up in this area as well, including at this show even several years ago now is that there's a lot of times that you'll see people expressing interest, but uh, it doesn't necessarily always mean that the cards are moving, even though they're asking about them. So what it really boils down to today was what was hot was cheap stuff. What was not hot, expensive stuff. That's <laughs> what I would say it probably uh, equates to. So let's move into the takeaways. There's going to be a few tie-ins here with that. Uh, something that I like, we'll start that off today, was... It was a very successful show for me networking wise. I have a very uh, good connection now, I would say, with several of the dealers. And it's just, it's good to know people. It's not even just, you know, making friends and hoping that you can get a deal in the moment. It's, it's building these connections in the hobby that really make this a rewarding experience. You know, these meeting good people who, you know, you scratch their back, they'll scratch yours and just, you know, people who are we're kind of all in this together type of atmosphere or feel to it. Uh, and I've, I've developed that connection with several of these guys now and just being doing this for enough time, you get to see the same faces over and over where you recognize them and you know their names. And uh, just continuing to develop that is always great. So even at shows where maybe I'm not always moving the most 
terms of sales and volume there or bringing back the most for my store, still making those connections. And sometimes those can be the most valuable uh, takeaways that you have or pickups from a show. So it doesn't hurt to talk to people, right? Uh, something that I didn't like, and this is not like, I'm, I'm not picking on anyone here, but I ran in, I run into this problem only one other time. And it's when I go to the national and it's that there is a lot of vintage at this show in particular. It's a very strong vintage show. And that's what its reputation has been built on. The difference is that I've seen some vintage shows where it's a lot of lower end vintage whereas here a lot of the cards that are in the showcases are higher end raw vintage singles which can be a bit scary at times especially for someone like me who doesn't deal too much in raw vintage singles it's probably one of my weakest areas in terms of what i do uh i just i'm not, I'm not always comfortable with it i will look for sure but the times that I actually make a deal on those types of cards is very few and far between. I can probably, I, I remember the big ones, but uh, I don't really remember some of the, the more obscure ones. Regardless, uh, a great advantage that is there, which is something I'm definitely more comfortable with, is typically pretty high grade. I'm talking about you know, going by the decade rule, add one or two grades above that when you're seeing these uh, you know, even a decade rule for mantles where you're seeing these sixes and sevens on these mantles uh, or even the older ones, the, the more expensive ones like your 54, uh, excuse me, not 54, 53 tops or your 53 Bowman color uh, or those types of cards are, they're in, you know, fours and fives, which are, are kind of, you know, ones and twos are expensive enough, but fours and fives, they're in a different stratosphere. Uh, just a lot of cases where the cheapest card might be $500. And, you know, that, that's great. I understand wanting to make as much money as possible, but realistically, there's not that many people who can afford to buy those cards out there. You're kind of catering to a niche audience and Hey, if you only do one or two sales, but you're selling some of those cards, you know, that could very well justify your trip to the show. Then if you make even more than those, then bam, you're uh, you're all set and squared away. Uh, but overall, it's just it's something that I know I noticed it at the national a lot, which makes a lot of sense there because it's there's a lot of overhead that comes with setting up at the national. But this is really the only other show where I see that where there's consistently a lot of high grade vintage. Uh, that really just has such a huge paywall in front of it that it kind of takes some of those tables out of play uh, for your average Joe or even someone like me who may be, I, I don't want to phrase this to sound like arrogant. I don't know. I apologize if it comes off that way. Someone who is, you know, willing to spend some money on some cards because, well, it's my livelihood. Um Hopefully that makes sense. It doesn't come off like a douche. That was definitely not my intention. Uh, to wrap up, something that I did like to end the day. I had mentioned this in my day one recap, so this is a bit of a cop-out, if you will. But uh, to reiterate it, because I saw it again today several times, was just dealers being really nice to the kids that were in attendance. I saw a lot of them just hooking them up with free Reds cards, uh, of their favorite players and numerous examples uh, throughout the weekend. Just really cool to see that, uh, you know, these dealers don't have to do that, but I'm seeing them not just even like say like here, pick a few cards out of this box. They're actually digging through these boxes with the kids and finding the cards and talking about the cards to them and asking them, you know, what they like and really just taking an interest in their hobby. That, that's something that I really don't even see sometimes from, from dealers. You know, that I think what makes a really good dealer sometimes is that when you can, you can have those conversations and you, you really get to know the person on the other side of the table and vice versa too. I mean, as a buyer, I mean, it does help to know the dealer a bit better. Um, I think that's part of the fun too, for me going to these shows, at least maybe I'm just a weirdo, but for me, that's, uh, I like going to the shows for the people a lot. Uh, but 
but to see that it, it's something that that will stick with uh the youngsters there and it's just really cool to see so hats off to those dealers i was very uh you know, very glad to see that. Uh, these these guys, they've been around a long time. They're professionals. They know what they're doing, uh, but they treat people right. That's why they've been successful for so long. So uh, there you go. That is my recap for the Muller Card Show. There will not be a day three recap. I am going to plan to stop back in very briefly on day three. I have a whatnot sale on the same day. So cannot stay as long as I did on day one and two, but just to wrap up a few little loose ends and maybe – grab something last minute out the door that I've had my eye on. There's a couple of cards I was looking at, but, but um, other than that, not too much uh, left to, uh, to square away with on this show. So until next time, take care, stay safe, be kind. Thanks for watching.